So the, the topic of the weekend, as you just saw, um, is, is the mystery. Um, I, I heard a story recently of a family that um, lived in the UK and they had um, a significant uh, number of, of members of their family who lived in Australia. And every year, the family in Australia would send the family in the UK a gift around Christmas time. And it would often be something um, Australian for them to try for the first time. And one year, um, just before Christmas, a, a little bottle of spice turned up from Australia. And uh, so they decided to, to put it into the, the Christmas pudding to, to see uh, what it would do to the flavor. Um, Christmas passed, they ate the Christmas pudding, and a few days after Christmas, a card arrived, which had originally been stuck to the little jar of spice. Um, and they opened it and it said, here's Aunt Mabel's ashes. Uh, she'd like to be spread on Clapham Common or somewhere like that. Um, so I, I guess she got her wish. She was spread far and wide. Um, some things are, are definitely better kept a mystery than others. Uh, some things definitely shouldn't be a mystery. So this morning, I want to talk to you about one man who wanted to be mysterious for all the wrong reasons, and two who were mysterious, but were trying not to be. So let's turn to Acts uh, chapter 8 first. This is the, the story of Simon the Magician. Um, and I'll just read it first. Uh, it's starting in verse 4. It says, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a, a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greater, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things Concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself was also, uh, also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they'd come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet... He had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them um, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that the, through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money saying, give me this power also that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part um, nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this, uh, your wickedness and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. So. This, uh, this story tells us that Simon claimed to be someone great. Um, I imagine he was a, a very well-educated man, probably quite well-traveled too. So I, I imagine he carried some presence uh, in any case. But to add to that, there were these wonders which he performed. Um, and you can see why he was so mysterious. He was a, a great magician. Um, and people wondered what was the power behind his actions. Um, and with all of that, he then had an, an elevated position in Sumerian society. However, in my humble opinion, it's pretty sad when you have to declare yourself to be someone great. It's even sadder that the people believed his magic and they claimed he was the great power of God. 
passage tells us that Simon deceived the people for a long time with his magic. And I think there must have been a lot of wonder and even fear of this mysterious man and his powers. The irony is that Christ himself had come to Samaria only a few years before, and he stayed for two days in the city, and many had believed in him. And yet, for some reason, even though they'd met Christ, it tells us they all gave heed to Simon. They'd met the real deal and somehow forgotten him and fallen for a cheap replica. I was thinking about how Simon chose his career path, and it dawned on me that being a professional magician in those days was almost the equivalent of being an influencer today. He was there to portray a false image, to deceive people into believing something and to use that to hold them under his sway. He wanted to be mysterious, to stand out from the crowd, to be someone He held power and influence over the people in Samaria, yet he had no responsibility to them. It's not as if he were to abuse his position of influence, then the people would vote in a new magician. Pretending to be the, the great power of God, I'm sure gave Simon a, a very comfortable existence, but it also gave him little accountability. Who's gonna be bold enough to pull up the great power of God on his actions? He couldn't lose his job, he had no boss. He didn't have to please his customers. In fact, he didn't really have customers, just those who were under his influence. He was made for life. And then this man, Philip, turns up and turns the world upside down. You see, his actions are completely different to Simon's. They're not designed to make Philip look good, but to bring glory to God. Philip wasn't seeking to hold people under his influence and to benefit from them. Quite the opposite, he wanted them to benefit from his ministry free of charge. He's not doing signs and wonders to be mysterious and to amaze people in order to influence them. He's healing the paralyzed, he's casting out demons. His actions are changing the lives of those who are suffering in this city. These people who were, were paralyzed or demon possessed, they'd, they'd lived for a long time under the influence of Simon and his magic had made absolutely no lasting difference to their lives. He may have held great influence over them, but they didn't feel any benefit from it. Verse eight tells us that when Philip arrived and lives began to be transformed, there was great joy in the city. Clearly, this was great joy that wasn't there before. Being influenced by Simon clearly hadn't brought anyone any lasting joy. Simon had failed where Philip had succeeded. Simon's been pulling rabbits out a hat for decades, declaring himself to be the great power of God. And then someone who is actually filled with the power of God turns up and shows him up as a fraud. Simon's actions had a temporal power of persuasion, but Philip's actions had an eternal weight to them. As soon as Philip arrived, Simon lost his mystery and his influence. No one's interested in the old rabbit hat trick anymore when the paralyzed are getting up and running and mad men are suddenly sane. He probably lost his income too. If you don't hold people under your sway anymore, what does a professional magician do for a living? Bar mitzvahs. Um, if you're no longer the great power of God, then you're just another one in the crowd. He wasn't mysterious anymore. In fact, Simon had been shown to be a complete fraud. So I should imagine there was some anger towards him by those who he deceived all those years, who'd held him in such high esteem. The Bible, the, the, the Bible tells us that Simon initially believes and is baptized in water. So then he follows Philip around for a while and he's blown away by the miracles and supernatural acts which he sees. Now he's in the position of being astounded by Philip. He's gone from influencer to someone who's influenced from a position of leadership to one of following, of being mysterious to, to being amazed by someone who's mysterious. On the outside, it looks like Simon's making all the right moves. He's baptized and he's following Philip. But then the apostles in Jerusalem in verse 14, they hear what's going on in Samaria. And so they send Peter and John down to help out. And when they arrive, they see that there's many who are following Christ, but 
whilst they've been baptized in water, they aren't yet baptized in the Holy Spirit. So they begin praying for people and laying on hands and people begin to be filled with the Spirit. So Simon watches all of this and this is where he faces a fork in the road moment. You see, instead of seeing people being filled with the Spirit and asking Peter to lay hands on him so that he could be filled with it too, he realizes that everyone's going to want to be filled with the Spirit of God and whoever has the power to fill people has power over them. You can see this in, in verse 19. Um, he says to Peter, give me this power. His heart was after the power, not the relationship. What he didn't realize was that in the spiritual realm, there is no power without relationship, either good or bad. But in Simon's mind, this could be his way back to regaining his status among the people and maybe even regaining his income. He just needs the ability to fill people with the spirit like Peter and John had. He needs that power. So he offers Peter and John money um, uh, in uh, verse 19. It says, give me this power. Um, oh, no, sorry, verse 18. And then he offered them money saying, give me this power. Um, if they'll give him the power to, to fill people with the spirit. This was an investment on his part. Once the apostles had moved on, he could start to charge people to be filled with the Spirit and make a living. He wanted the franchise, Simon's Spirit-filling services incorporated. Just imagine once, uh, he'd once again be known as the great power of God, and this time, rightfully so, he'd have the power to determine who got filled with the Spirit of God and who didn't. The status, the influence, the mystery, he'd have it all again. He'd been shown up as a fraud when Philip arrived and started changing lives where his, his magic had no power to do so. But this time, he'd actually have supernatural ability. Uh, his powers and his influence wouldn't wane. He'd be able to move from the preternatural to the supernatural. And by offering them money to have the power of filling people with the spirit, he could give himself a monopoly because then others would have to pay too. But Peter's response um, in verse 20, is swift and brutal. Your money perish with you. It's interesting that the same Peter also wrote in 2 Peter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it's not that God willed Simon to perish, but Peter was just stating a fact that this is exactly what will happen. If this is your priority, influence power, money, then you'll perish just as your money will. And then Peter goes on to explain why. Because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. He didn't want God. He wanted to monetize the gift of God. He wanted to pay for it and then to start charging people for it. But a gift is always given free of charge or it's not a gift. Simon's sin was to think he could purchase the free gift of God. And yet that's so often a sin which we commit to. The free gift of salvation cannot be bought with money, with self-righteousness, with Bible reading or church attendance. Salvation has already been purchased at unthinkable cost on the cross, so it can be given freely to you and I. In verse 22, um, Peter goes on to tell him to repent, to avoid perishing. And he says in verse 23, for I see you're poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. As Peter rightly says, bitterness is a poison, one of the most awful poisons. And if it's in your heart today, then like Simon, you need to repent. If you know you're bound by sin, that there are things in your life which you cannot stop doing, then again, you need to repent and ask God to break those chains. Simon's re response in verse 24 is very telling. He says to Peter, pray to the Lord for me. And you'll notice it doesn't say anywhere that Peter did so. Repentance is not something which someone else can ask on your behalf. 
It's something which is directly between you and God. It's relational. If you read about Simon's life from other sources, it seems that repentance wasn't something he was willing to do. And he ended up leading many away from the gospel. Simon wanted to be mysterious, but for his own gain, to hold influence over people. And when he encountered a real man of God, the real motivation of his heart was exposed. He didn't really want a relationship with God. And God was definitely not going to force one on him. Um, I think the interesting thing about this story is you see that he can go so far. He believes and he's baptized in water and he follows Philip, doesn't he? But it's only when the spirit of God is filling men, filling their hearts, that actually the real motivation of his heart is exposed, that God is not going to come in and indwell alongside bitterness and sin in his heart. And that's where he faces that fork in the road. And unfortunately, he chose the wrong one. So let's quickly look at Peter and John. Um, if we turn to Acts 3, these are two simple, uneducated fishermen. In their yearbook in school, I'm sure they would have been voted least mysterious. Um, naturally speaking, they would have been considered absolutely nothing, of no influence or importance, and yet they were world changers. Let's just read um, a bit of chapter three. Um, <clears throat> we're going to jump in in verse three. So this is a man who's lame outside the temple. It says, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked for arms and fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging arms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? And then he goes on to, to preach Christ to them. Um, this man has been lame for 40 years. Um, and it says in verse 8 that he entered the temple and was walking and leaping and praising God. He would have been known to everyone in the, who, who attended the temple. For decades, he must have sat begging every single day. He would have been a, a fixture you would have known would always be there, sitting at the gate until the day he died, begging for arms. Um, he was unable to go inside because he was lame, but he sat on the, the, the edge of the, the temple begging. And yet now the people see him in the temple, leaping up and down and shouting praise to God for his healing. This would have been the first time he was allowed in the temple. And you can see the, the joy of his healing has overwhelmed him. And in verse 11, you see all the people run to Peter and John and they are greatly amazed at the healing of this man. Peter and John had every opportunity to use this mystery to their own advantage, as Simon uh, used his. But instead, Peter responds in verse 12, and he makes it clear that it's not through their power or godliness that this man has been healed. And he goes on to preach Christ. He purposely popped his own mystery because he wanted to make it clear it was nothing to do with them. And then as the story goes on, if you read on in your own time, you'll see Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests, they have Peter and John arrested and brought to them. Um, and the next morning, they're 
they're, they're summoned in front of them to explain their actions. And remember, these are the same high priests who arrested Christ and had him crucified. And Peter and John had both been present in the priest's courtyard when Christ was questioned. And here they are now in the same position. And they're asked by what power or name they had healed the man. And they're very clear that they healed him in the name of Jesus. And then in verse 13, it tells us that the chief, the, the chief priests perceived that they were uneducated, untrained, um, and they marveled. And then it goes on to say um, in the next verse that they realized that they'd been with Christ. What they saw in Peter and John wasn't the result of learning something. They were uneducated. They hadn't learned this behavior. They hadn't learned this power. It wasn't like Simon's magic. This was as a result of having been with Christ. And what it means there it wasn't that they'd just sat next to Christ at a dinner party one time. It means that Annas and Caiaphas recognized that the same spirit that was in Christ was now residing in Peter and John. Can you imagine how chilling that must have been for Annas and Caiaphas? As they realized they've managed to kill Christ only for him to come back to life. And now it's spreading. His life hasn't been exterminated. In fact, the complete opposite has happened. It's now viral. People are being transformed and being filled with the spirit of Christ. And you can see in verse 17, they panic. And they say to one another, but that it spreads no further among the people. Let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no one in this name. Um, they're so desperate, they resort to threats of violence to try and stop this spreading amongst the people. These men were a complete mystery. How could they be so clearly uneducated un and untrained and yet be turning the world upside down and performing miracles? How could the Christ who they'd killed so clearly be alive and living in these very simple fishermen? It was an incredible mystery, but it's a mystery no longer because if we turn to Colossians 1, 24, um, I'm going to unravel this for you. It says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but, has now, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There it is. That's, it's revealed, the mystery. Christ in you. God himself wants to come and to live in and through you. If that doesn't make you a mystery out in the world out there, nothing will. Those three words, Christ in you, are some of the most shocking words ever written in human history. How is it even possible that Christ himself should wish to come and indwell my heart? I think if we were to really get a hold of this truth, it would utterly transform us. It would transform our churches, our communities. God wills to make his home right here in my heart. But as we saw with Simon, if your focus is on influence and power and money, if you're not interested in a relationship with God, then he won't force himself on you. If you want to be mysterious for the wrong reasons, well, this isn't for you. God has got to root out bitterness and sin in my heart before he can make it a temple of his Holy Spirit. But if your heart desires relationship with God, then the greatest mystery known to mankind can be revealed, can be real in your life too. Christ in you, 
the hope of glory. Um, fairly recently, I attended a, a business conference. This was pre-COVID. And just like the, the Reading Youth Weekend, they sent me out a pack in advance. And just like the, the Youth Weekend pack, there was also a book in it, which was this one, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And basically, the, the whole point of this conference was that people today are not interested in working nine to five to get a, a living to pay a mortgage. They need a cause to work for which goes far beyond making money. They need to find their why. And the summary was that businesses such as Tesla, for example, which is the world's most valuable car manufacturer, whose mission statement doesn't even mention cars, but talks about transitioning the world towards a sustainable future are the ones that will attract the best staff and create customer loyalty. And the reason for this is a crisis of significance. People are crying out for a purpose and, and meaning to their lives. And if a company can provide some sense of meaning for an employee or a customer, then they'll thrive. But if Christ is in me, then I found my why. Every moment of every day, even in lockdown, has significance. Why? Because I'm bringing Christ to those around me, to my family and my friends, to those I interact with. It means that the words which come out of my mouth have huge significance because I'm representing Christ here on earth. It means every aspect of my life is significant. Um, I was looking online and I discovered that Minecraft has been played for a total of 68 million years. So this morning I took the minimum wage and applied that to that time frame and it gives you 5.2 trillion pounds, which is enough to give every single person in the world below the poverty line the sum of 7,000 pounds. Now, I'm not against video games. I played them when I had free time too. And the same point could be made about lots of other hobbies. But the point I'm making is your life has incredible importance. And even at the minimum wage, you can see how valuable your time is. So how much more valuable is your life and your time when you're a vessel bringing Christ to those around you? You're a member of the royal family, a, a standard bearer for the king, an ambassador presenting, representing Christ to those you encounter. So... If, like Simon, you're seeking to be a mystery for influence and power and money, then I hope God has been able to shine a light on the motives of your heart this morning. If you know there's bitterness or sin residing in your heart, that can be dealt with this morning, but it has to be dealt with by you. No one else can do that on your, your behalf. And if you know that you want to be a temple of the Holy Spirit and that you want Christ to come and indwell you. You want that mystery, the greatest mystery of, of all time, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Then this morning, you can ask for that. And God is faithful to pour out his spirit into your life. Don't seek to be a mystery. Allow God to make you a mystery.